Greetings, unsettled souls, and welcome to the correct view. Is there any confusion there with when I hit go? I have a stupid story that I'm covering that keeps refreshing the page and the audio keeps coming over. Guys, welcome to the correct view. Sam I.B. DeGangi reporting for The Media Speaks, and I have been swarmed with science stories that I've been gathering for uh, news from the science front. Science. Science. And uh, guess what? I can't get to all of them on the Saturday edition. Runs 2 p.m. at TheMediaSpeaks.com every Saturday, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I cannot get to all of these stories. I am swarmed. So what I'm doing is a story that all of the people that don't like my politics, that like my science, are going to love. Some of you, I know, you follow me on the Fukushima stories, God love you. But you think that man's warming the planet. You're wrong. Alright, you don't like those stories. You like the science stories. Well, guess what? This never happens. All science, all show. It'll be amazing to see if anybody finds anything to fight about on this uh, story. Maybe the last one, the dumb knee. But other than that, it's simply a matter of science fact. So here we go with all the stories that I could not get to on the weekly news from the science front. This is from ivytimes.co.uk. A great shark, a great white shark measuring nine feet uh, that was savagely devoured by a mystery creature off Australia's coast has become the topic of a documentary with filmmaker David Riggs looking to find out what mystery creature was responsible for the attack. The film, Hut for the Super Predator, which is due to air on the Smithsonian Channel, sees Riggs hunting down the creature that attacked and killed the shark on the Southern Ocean 11 years ago. Riggs, a cinematographer, has worked tirelessly since to find out what could have killed one of the ocean's top predators. In other words, things do not just magically eat. A nine-foot shark, especially one as predatory and as aggressive as a great white. In the film, Australian scientists explain that the great white shark had been tagged with a tracking device. They said that the shark was eaten by a mystery creature in the depths of the ocean four months later with a tag washing up to shore about four kilometers from where it was initially tagged. In the clip from the film, the rig says, when I when I first told about the data that came back from the tag that was on the shark, I was absolutely blown away. The shark had been swimming at a depth of 1,900 feet when there was a huge temperature change going from 7 degrees Celsius to 25 degrees Celsius in just seconds. Scientists say that this could only have happened by the shark being eaten by another creature, or might I add a very big, vicious creature. The latter temperature indicates that the tag was inside the stomach of another animal. The question not only came to my mind, but everyone else's involved was, what did that, Reg said? It was, abs it was obviously eaten. What's going to eat a shark that big? What could kill a nine-foot great white? It says, possibility explored in a documentary from legendary creatures like Kuju and Godzilla, that's ridiculous, to another much larger shark that, shark that was so hungry that it attacked its own species. Do sh great white sharks or other sharks get that much bigger than nine feet that it can eat a nine foot great white in just seconds? I'm not buying that one. Looking at the profile of the animal that ate it, 26 degrees, that's pretty high, but not enough to be a mammal. But it's something seriously huge to sustain that temperature. The larger the animal, the more capable it is of an elevated temperature. The notion of gigantism is well documented in species. To me, that's plausible. Again, what kind of giganticism would you have to have suffered to have... Uh, eating a nine-foot shark. I'm sorry, I don't buy it. So it's probably something that, uh, you know, again, if you see it, you were labeled, labeled as a nutcase or something. Now it looks like uh, one of those very strange creatures could be coming, uh, well, could be coming to uh, the buffet that was this great white shark. Um, but really, I think it's interesting. I mean, we found the Kraken. We found Noah's Ark. We found strange things like this prior. So, I mean, this could be another one. NewScientist.com, as we go on to our science-filled edition of The Correct Views. 
Skinny wormholes could send messages through time. I was captivated by this. Invisibility and time travel. Those are two superpowers, I think, if I was uh, granted wishes in such a realm that I would take. Like some bizarre form of optical fiber, a long, thin wormhole might let you send messages through time using pulses of light. Predicted by Einstein's general theory of relativity, wormholes are tunnels connecting two points in space-time. If something could traverse one, it would open up intriguing possibilities, such as time travel and instant communication. Now, but there's a problem. Einstein's wormholes are notoriously unstable, and there's a link for that here. And they don't stay open long enough for anything to get through. In 1988, Kip Thorne at the California Institute of Technology and his colleagues suspeculated, suspeculated that wormholes could be kept open using a form of negative energy called Kashmir energy, and that's C-A-S-I-M-I-R. Quantum mechanics tells us, and I'm not, uh, I, I'm not fluent on this, but if you look at the uh, past, um, the correct views, simulated universe, it touches on this. Quantum mechanics tells us that the vacuum of space is teeming with random quantum fluctuations, which create waves of energy. Now imagine two metal plates sitting parallel in this vacuum. Some energy waves are too big to fit between the plates, so the amount of energy between them is less than the surrounding them. In other words, space-time between the plates has negative energy. Theoretical attempts to use such plates to keep wormholes open so far have proved untenable. Now Luke Butcher at the University of Cambridge may have found a solution. What, he asks, if the wormhole could take the place of the plates, he says. In other words, under the right circumstances, could the tube-like shape of the wormhole itself generate Casimir energy? His calculations show that if the wormhole's throat is orders of magnitude larger than its width of its mouth, it does indeed create Casimir energy at its center. Unfortunately, this energy isn't enough to keep the wormhole stable. It would collapse, says Butcher, but the existence of negative energy does allow the wormhole to collapse very slowly. Further rough calculations can show that the wormhole center might remain open long enough to allow the pulse of light to get through. This is interesting for a few fronts. Um, and there's been lots of people, whether it's crop circles or whatever, that claim that it's from time travel. I'm not going to go ahead and say that I'm ready to commit myself to believing in time travel, but I will commit myself to saying it's interesting to explore the possibilities of. Um, the more it looks to be true, the more it looks like, you know, who knows who we've been contacted from when. Again, am I in that case saying that I believe that all of this has already happened? No. I'm reporting on the science that very likely could point to such things happening. Said so the wormhole is a shortcut through space-time. There's tons of links on here. So sending a light pulse through one could allow faster than light communication. And as the two mouths of the wormhole could exist at different points in time, in theory, a message could be sent through time. But your caution is that uh, more work is needed to confirm that other parts of the wormhole besides the center remain open long enough for light to make it all the way through. That's interesting. Otherwise, it could, like... Um, bottleneck up and close. He also needs to work out whether the pulse, large enough to transmit meaningful information, could sneak through the slowly collapsing throat. And of course, we are a long way off translating the theoretical equations into a physical object. The last paragraph, friends, on this. Does this mean that we have the technology for building a wormhole? Asks Matt Meeser at the Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand. The answer is still no. Still, he is intrigued by Butcher's works. From physics perspective, it may revitalize interest in wormholes. So it's interesting. It's interesting to speculate. What, what would you say to somebody or uh, to some distant time, perhaps, if you were able to send a message in light? How would you try to make them understand what it was? They might think it was ghosts. They might think it was aliens, demons, angels. Um... So, I mean, interesting story right there. Um, tons of links worth looking up. I looked up a couple myself in just prepping for this. Um, YahooNews.com. 
This is this is cool. I like this. Um, I always put the picture up as the the image on this, but this is too dark. Students discover the seven thousand year old mummy in Chile. A group of students discovered a 7,000-year-old mummy during a trip to northern Chile, local media reported Monday. It looked a lot like Hillary. All right, just a little political. Uh, La Tercera newspaper reported that the find was made by chance Saturday during a visit to the Moro de Arica site by local students. The children, at-risk youth enrolled in archaeology workshop, were performing excavation work when one found a strange shape under dog droppings. Ancient archaeological artifacts have been forced toward the surface following the powerful 8.2 earthquake that rocked the region in April, reports say. Trip organizer Hans Nyaira said the discovery of the mummy, part of the Chinchoro culture, showed that the area should be declared a protected zone. I would agree. I mean, you found a 7,000-year-old mummy. I think it's worthy to assume that he was buried with other things, other people, um, animals. It'd be worth checking out for sure. Friends, you're listening to The Correct Views. We are doing a rare catch-up on uh, science, science and nothing but science, leftover stories from news from the science front that I haven't got to. I'd like to say quickly that if you have a chance to uh, really read something this summer, then you're going to want to go to Facebook.com and look up Mike McLaughlin. Um, he's been writing some of the most awesome short stories extant today. He's located in Canton, Ohio, if you're Facebooking him from other areas. Ask him about his poetry. You're going to propose to somebody, maybe. Give him a poem. You want to read really good fiction. Ask him what he's got. He's got amazing stories. While you're at it, go to Amazon.com and look up my works. Sam DeGangie. I have three stories up. Uh, the Lucky Leprechaun is a rather... Um, Tales of the cryptish kind of story. There's my novel, which is very brutal, The uh, Sleep Unknowing. It's somewhat politically charged horror story. And um, a book that proves the resurrection of Christ really happened without using the Bible to do it. It's a perfect, persuasive essay called Risen. Guys, um, CNET.com, mind pilots steer plain sim with thoughts alone. Kyle Phillips knows that I am absolutely obsessed with the flying car. So I, I was hearing about this, and I thought this was inter interesting. Thanks to her kick-butt skill of telekinesis, my secret superhero power wish, the author writes, longtime X-Men alum Jean Grey can move things with her mind, and she's not the only one. New research out of the... Tetchenichi Universität München in Germany, for all of you that now know I have butchered the Deutsch language, is hinting that mind control might soon reach entirely new heights, even by us non-mutants. They've demonstrated that pilots might be able to fly planes through the sky using their thoughts alone. We already have flying cars that people are trying to build. You can look this up that you don't need a pilot's license to fly, they have a parachute, if the engine dies, it lands and takes off itself. Granted, these things would have to be done at airports, but this is even cooler if they could meld the two together here. The researchers hooked study participants to a cap, again, no brain implants, containing dozens of electroesonography electro electrodes, so try saying that 20 times, set them down in a flight simulator and told them to steer the plane through the sim using their thoughts alone. The cap read the electrical signals from their brains to an algorithm that then translated those signals into computer commands. They have my attention fully. Seven people underwent the experiment and according to researchers, all were able to pilot the plane using only their thoughts to such a degree that their performance could have satisfied some for the criteria of getting a pilot's license. Once more, the study participants were not all pilots and had varying levels of flight experience. One had no cockpit experience at all. That's awesome news. I mean, this could really be helpful to paralyzed people. Um, 
people that are obsessed with flying cars like me, a large number of people, this is great news. It's not done with some spooky uh, singularity uh, garbage put into your brain or anything. It says, we have, of course, been similar thought control experiments that we've seen before. An artist who can paint with her thoughts and another who causes water to vibrate. There's all kinds of links for these. For example, as well as a quadcopter controlled by brainwaves and a thought-powered typing solution. But there's something particularly remarkable about the idea of someone actually flying an airplane with just the mind. I agree. I think that's wonderful. It says the research was part of an EU-funded program called a Brain Flight. A long-term vision of the project is to make flying accessible to more people. That's wonderful news, friends. Look the article up and remember that you heard about it here on the correct views first when you're flying. And again, I'm not that old. For a lot of people uh, that know how quickly science progresses, there's a chance that we might actually get to see this. Um, Gawker.com, two more stories to get to. World's biggest dinosaur found in Argentina. It's awesome. Scientists in Argentina have uncovered the bones of a creature believed to be the world's biggest dinosaur. The big guy would have weighed 77 metric tons, heavier than the previous record holder, the Argentinosaurus. Truly a sad day to be the ghost of the Argentinosaurus. Scientists who spoke to the BBC, and there's a link, believe that it is a new species of titanosaur, which is an enormous herbivore from the late Cretaceous period, characterized by small heads, long beaks, and long tails. Um, I've recently seen that the uh, Sandusky Cedar Point, believe it or not, their little dinosaur exhibit, um, that there is no brontosaurus. They have since found that there is no such creature. It was one of a species of creatures. And the more you read on this, no matter what your age is, the more amazing it becomes. Based on measurements, it continues, of its thigh bones, the dinosaur would have been 130 feet long and 65 feet tall. After a local farm worker stumbled upon the remains, paleontolog paleontologists unearthed the partial skeletons of seven individuals, about 150 bones in total and in all remarkable condition. Let's remember the last story, uh, a couple stories ago, I should say, students, students found um, the 7,000-year-old mummy. Now uh, we have uh, a farmer just but tripping over these bones for the, one of the most amazing dinosaur species ever uncovered. After, uh, the dinosaur doesn't have a name yet, but the researchers told the BBC it will be named describing its magnificence and in honor to both the region and the farm owners who alerted us about the discovery. What, the Universal Argentinosaurus? Uh, the massive big-ass source. I don't know, guys, but you heard about it here. And that brings us to the dum de dum de dum de dum de dum de of the day. Um, I've got mad hits on the dunce cap of the month. If you haven't seen it, it just went up. Didn't think I'd have a dum de story for the science front. Well, I do, and this is from Natural Society, Christina Sarich. Toxic controversy, why is mercury still used in vaccines? Now, this is a good question. Because I know I've got people here that believe that vaccines are totally safe. I don't believe that. I don't avoid all vaccines, by the way. But I avoid uh, the vast majority. I don't remember the last time I've been vaccinated for anything. Am I against all polio vaccines? Not necessarily. Am I against flu vaccines? Yes. But let's, let's pretend that I believe vaccines are perfectly safe. If there's already doubt and extreme bad press involving mercury, which is to say thermosol, as a preservative in these vaccines, no matter how much it costs to change it to maybe a more expensive and safer, less controversial, if you will, preservative, why have they not done it? Think about it. Think about it. Um, everyone says that, that as a promoter, I have to can't say it without looking at it, but the, the yoga mat material that's in most breads in fast food restaurants, Subway took it out. They don't really believe it's bad for you, but they're saying, all right, fine. It's a, 
this much of a controversy over it, we're going to go ahead and just relent and take it out of the damn bread. You would think the vaccine industry would do the same thing. Well, listen to this. One of the biggest controversies raging among anti-vaccine supporters and those who still believe in being vaccinated is over the overuse of thermosol. The discussion is often heated and emotional. Some have even claimed that the CDC, who is getting today's dumdy of the day for doing this, is hiding information linking thermosol use, and there's a ton of links in this article, to conditions like autism while others try to debunk the claim. The mercury-based preservative is indeed still in many vaccines, but is it safe? Merck, GlaxoSmithKline, Sanofi, Pasteur, and Novartis are still manufacturing vaccines which contain mercury or thermosol. Because they're too dumb to change it, that's why they got the dumdy of the day. It is even used in influenza vaccine given to children as young as six years old. Mercury is a known neurotoxin. The FDA calls thermosol a mercury-containing organic compound that has been widely used since the 1930s as a preservative in many drugs, including vaccines. Yeah, you know, well, heroin was used even before that for pain medication. Do you think it's wise? They go on to say that due to concerns over neurotoxicity, thermosol has been removed or reduced to trace amounts in all vaccines routinely used in children six and younger, with the exception of influenza A vaccine. The FDA also admits that vaccines, which still contain thermosol, contain only one microgram or less of mercury per dose. Well, you're getting more and more micrograms, the more jabs you get, aren't you? Well, what level of thermosol cuts off at being safe? Is it 10 vaccines or is it 20? Um, I take selenium every day, if you don't know what it is. It's one of the only vitamins, minerals, whatever you want to call it, supplements to um, be acknowledged by the FDA as a massive cancer prevention drug. And it's measured in micrograms. So don't tell me that just because there's just a little bit of mercury in it that it's suddenly okay for you. Mercury is a heavy metal poison, it says. You can get mercury poisoning from many things besides vaccines. Eating sushi, which if you do after Fukushima, you are crazy. Having mercury amalgams in your teeth or living near a coal mine or other industrial site that pollutes the environment with mercury. You can also get mercury poisoning from ting vaccines. What's more, mercury is lymphatic, which means that it concentrates to where there is fatty tissue. The brain is full of fatty tissue. You can tell that if you've ever listened to a Beyonce record. Most brains are a whopping three pounds of fatty tissue. Uh, for Beyonce fans, it's double that. This means that while mercury from any source, including vaccines, may be small, it accumulates in the body, especially in the brain. And Dr. Mark Heyman presented a paper at the Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine in New Orleans entitled The Impact of Human Health and Environment. Now, Let's pretend that this is all conspiracy insanity. How many times have you heard a conspiracy story that you know is true? Is it one out of every ten? Is it one out of every five? What is it? Okay, let's pretend that only some of these are right. The rest are all crazy talk. Symptoms of etherism with symptoms of shyness, emotional liability, nervousness, insomnia, memory impairment, and inability to concentrate. CNS symptoms may include um, encephalopathy. I don't even know what that is. I'm usually up on this stuff. Peripheral neuropathy, Parkinsonian symptoms, that means the tremors. Um, Ataxia, impaired hearing, tunnel vision, dysarthia, headache, fatigue, impaired sexual function, oh that's just great, and depression. Renal toxicity includes proteinuria, that's kidney trouble there, renal syndrome, and acute renal failure. Gastrointestinal symptoms include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and colitis. You ever see Crohn's colitis? Look it up, it's miserable. Dermal toxicity includes allergic dermatitis. Uh, Celitis, gingivitis, stomatitis, and excessive salivation. It's like Bill Clinton looking at a porn. If vaccine supporters really want us to believe vaccines are safe, why do they still contain a substance that causes that laundry list of health problems? Dumb the other day. Friends, you are listening to...
the correct views. Sam I B DeGangi is signing off. Do me a favor and go, go, go to the mediaspeaks.com. Look up the work of Kyle Court D Lake and myself. We're always publishing articles and stories. Donate to this show if you can. Um, every penny you give to me goes to a better show. Hit subscribe, hit share. Good night, friends. God bless.